So, is the Tesla Model 3 a family car? I'll tell you right now, no, of course it isn't. Family cars look like this and this. But maybe that's not the best question and maybe it's not as simple as a yes or no answer. Let me explain. Hi, I'm Mark and I'm all about psychology, tech and productivity and in today's video I want to try and answer a question that was bothering me when I was trying to decide whether or not to buy this car. We're a family of four with a three year old and a seven month old so the question of whether this is workable as our single family car was a really important one for us to consider and the main word that comes up when talking about family cars is practicality but practicality is a really broad church so I want to try and break this down into a number of different areas before arriving at my own conclusion. So we'll be looking at space, we'll be looking at functionality, we'll be looking at running costs, and we'll be looking at fun. Let's get into it. So thinking about space, now of course the amount of space that you need is going to be subjective and it kind of depends on how big your family are and how old your children are. Now if you've got one to two children and they're more than five or six years old and you're thinking about buying this car, stop watching this video and go and buy the car because it'll work really well. If you have younger children, this video is for you to help you decide if you can make this car work for you and your needs. So prior to owning a Model 3, we had a BMW X3. And without a doubt, this was a full blown family car. Huge high riding 4x4, acres of room in the cabin and in the boot, a massive 600 mile range on a full tank and plenty of room to carry all the stuff that you need. Just look at this enormous hatchback boot, packed and ready for a week away. We managed to fit in food, toys, clothes, a pram, a travel cot and all our beach stuff. And when we went to test drive Model 3, it became immediately apparent that both the shape and the size of the boot was going to present some problems for us. And just look at it, it's like a cross between a Porsche and a BMW 3 Series, it doesn't kind of scream family car at you. Now before we look at how we've adapted to this car, I think it's important to look at this through the lens of something called Parkinson's Law. So Parkinson's Law is the idea that work expands to fill the time available for completion. So it probably applies to things like meetings, projects and work related stuff. But I think the same thing applies to physical space. Now, if you've ever moved into a different house, flat or apartment, if you're moving into a different size of space, you probably find yourself wondering, how on earth am I gonna fill this with all of my stuff? If you're moving into a large space, or how on earth am I gonna find space for all of my things if you're moving somewhere smaller? And Parkinson's law would dictate things just naturally work out. And the same is true here. What we realized was that we only ever really used the full capacity of that BMW load space on very rare occasions like holidays, extended trips away, and so on. Most of our everyday driving in the Model 3 still affords plenty of space for all the things that we need to bring with us. Now the other thing we've noticed is that the Model 3 has about the same amount of space as was available in the X3, it's just that the space was distributed quite differently. Even though from the outside it looks quite big, the X3 had relatively little room inside the cabin for things like rear room and passenger space due to having an engine and due to having quite a large boot space. By comparison, there's tons more internal storage space in the Model 3. Now in practical terms, that means lots of extra nooks and crannies to store things, or if you don't have to carry lots of things, you can just stretch out and be more comfortable. Also, whilst the X3 boot space was large and easy to access as a hatchback, with the Model 3, you get three different spaces, which added together represent about the same amount of space. You have the main boot compartment, the underfloor storage, which is cavernous, and the frunk, which admittedly isn't huge, but is plenty big enough to store things like bags, welly boots, and anything you don't want touching anything that's in the boot. I was convinced I would need to purchase and install the roof bars and a roof rack so that we could carry more things with us, but we've not reached that point yet. However, Christmas is just around the corner and we are planning on driving to see family this year. So we may have to invest in some roof storage to transport all of our overnight kit, as well as Christmas gifts. We'll see. Just before we move on from space, I wanted to touch on a specific point which somebody asked me about in a previous video. Does this fit a pram and also give you space to carry other things? I'm gonna put a pram in which is an eye candy peach. This is one of the more chunkier prams on the market. Now our baby is big enough to be out of the bassinet attachment, uh, but when she was, this still fit in and still gave you room to um, add other things into the boot. Now you can see how much space is left here with the pram in. Easily some space for extra bags, coats, and of course you have the underfloor storage and the front space to draw on if you need it. What I would say is that you probably couldn't fit in a pram 
as well as a travel cot into the boot storage. There's just not enough space. However, as you'll see in the rear, as there's no drivetrain, you've got a totally flat floor and I could easily fit our travel cot in that space should we need to. And this is where it's about getting creative with how the space is distributed in this vehicle. Yes, there's not as much boot space as you'll find in a typical SUV, but there's more than you think if you look at the car as a whole. Let's move on to functionality. So how functional is this car to own when you're carting around a family of four? Especially two young children and all the stuff that they tend to come with. So let's start with the rear seats and Isofix points. So we have these two child seats and they were really easy to fit. The Isofix points aren't as easy to locate as some of the German cars we've used in the past, but they're kind of hidden behind the padding, just right at the base of the seat. It takes a little while to find them, but as long as you're not taking the seats in and out of the car regularly, it shouldn't present too much of a problem. It's important to note that there were only Isofix points in the rear of the car, not in the front as you might find in some other family cars. In real terms, this means that if you ever need to get in the back to sit between those two child seats, you're either going to need very narrow hips or be prepared to put up with a certain amount of discomfort. It's possible, but I wouldn't want to be there for more than half an hour at a time. Onto other areas, the doors open really wide so it's really easy to get kids in and allow them to hop out when you arrive at your destination. So keyless entry wasn't a feature I thought would be hugely advantageous from a family point of view, but it's actually, in practice, has turned into something that's a real benefit. It's common that I might be walking to the car carrying a baby or holding my toddler's hand, and it's not often the case that you might have two hands available to fumble around for some keys to open the car before you put them in. With a Tesla, it's not an issue because you literally just walk up to the car, open the door, and you're good to go. I also have this non-Tesla watch app installed, which means you can use Siri or a tap of your watch to control pretty much any feature of the car without even needing to get your phone out. Pretty cool. Finally, anyone with kids will tell you that they are usually in charge of what music gets played in the car. Now in our previous car, we had Spotify, but you had to access it by one of those clip wheels, which was really clunky and quite difficult to use and not at all safe if you were moving at speed. With the Tesla, you just press the right hand button on the steering wheel once and you can use voice commands to request any song you want. And if you're anything like me, you'll be hitting that repeat button on the screen so that whatever song gets requested gets played 20 times on repeat while you quietly lose your mind in the driving seat. So on to safety, a key element of having a family car is safety concerns. And there's good news here. A Tesla lead with this in their marketing saying that Tesla vehicles are engineered to be the safest in the world and in fact the Model 3 has a Euro NCAP rating of 5 stars so you can be pretty sure that there are not many of the cars on the road which will protect you and your family more than this one. And this doesn't just extend to how the car is built, I've been using Autopilot quite a bit on UK motorways and it really is astonishing and the number of times I've been shocked at how quickly autopilot has reacted when a car has pulled in in front of me or maybe another car has braked in another lane causing another car to pull out the speed that it can react and see some of these incidents taking place is really astounding and so clever and it's often far quicker than I've seen or reacted to it I never thought I'd be in a position where I was putting trust in a radar system to keep our family safe on the road but this thing really is very clever and I would encourage you to try it out a final point on safety, the sentry mode alarm automatically records footage if somebody gets too close to your car or tries to break in. So if you're away from your car and somebody happens to have left something valuable, it might not be possible to prevent it from being stolen, but you'll get really good footage from the sentry system, which you can pass on to your insurance company and to the police. So on to costs. Now, when a lot of people ask whether a car is practical, what they really mean is, does it cost a fortune to run? And let me be honest, our previous car cost a ton to keep. So as you can see here with our previous car over the cost of a year we paid service and maintenance costs, road tax, insurance and that's before you even get to adding fuel and with a 600 mile tank that used to cost easily £100 or more every time you fueled up and the vehicle had a higher on the road price as well. Our Model 3 on the other hand will have zero to no maintenance costs, having said that we have just scraped an alloy so we'll have to get that repaired soon. Road tax is zero, insurance is a little bit less and in the month that we've owned this car this is how much we've spent on charging. This is a combination of free public charging and home charging. The on the road price was also a little bit lower, but of course you would expect that with this being a saloon. Even if you factor in the cost of fitting a home charger, and you can check the link in the description to see which one I went with and how it was fitted, it's still a huge saving. I mean, just look at this difference. I will look in a year or so at the true cost of ownership, but my estimate is that the cost of running this car will be about this amount compared to the cost of running our previous ICE car. 
Now we're planning on keeping our Model 3 for at least four years, so we'll be able to put all of that saved money to good use in that time. So last up, fun. I have to admit, when I was thinking about choosing a family car, the idea of a fun car probably wasn't high on our list of must-haves, but honestly, it should have been. No matter how good your range is, the fact is that if you own an EV, you might find yourself waiting for 20, 30 minutes or more while you wait for a charge on a long road trip, and it's helpful to have some things available to keep both adults and kids entertained. So first of all, you have built-in Netflix and YouTube on this huge screen, and with the sound system in place, this is a godsend and a really easy way to kill time while waiting. But there's more. Our three-year-old loves the emissions mode, aka the fart box, and especially when we have somebody in the car who's never been in a Tesla before. There's also karaoke, a drawing pad, and the amazing beach buggy racing. This is without doubt a fun car for any age kid to spend time in. And whilst I could have covered this in another one of the sections, I feel it's important to mention as a kind of entertainment, the panoramic roof and this beautiful bit of glass is something that I often see our kids gazing up and out of. In fact, I actually spotted that our baby fell asleep the other day just staring up at the clouds in about 15 minutes on a motorway. It was great. If kids are given the choice of being able to see not just what's immediately next to them, but what's above them, whether it be light, dark, snow, rain, sunshine, or just blue sky and clouds going by, the roof design is a great feature. So in conclusion then, at the start of this video I asked the question, is the Tesla Model 3 a family car? And maybe a more accurate question was, was the Model 3 designed as a family car? Probably not. But do you know what? It's really easy to make it work as one. And it's all about setting your expectations right. Think about how you're going to use all of that available storage. Think about the savings that you'll make from switching to an EV. Think about family road trips with karaoke in place. What are you waiting for? Go and get a test drive booked and see for yourself. So I really hope this answered a few questions you might have if you're thinking about switching to the Model 3 as a family car. If you enjoyed this, please hit the like button. If you'd like to see more like this, maybe even a cheeky subscribe. I'll see you next time.